Good morning. Good morning, everyone. To hear these words, friends, from the book of Psalms, where David writes about his longing for God. My soul, no, not that one, Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary, and behold and beheld your power and your glory, because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you, and I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. That's really quite personal stuff that he's doing. It's very demonstrative. In your name, I will lift up my hands. It's, it's a very personal way of speaking about God. Maybe it's also surprising coming from David because he was very much a man's man. And you might kind of think, well, this is a sort of way women talk. You know, kind of women's approach to spirituality is a lot finer and gentler and more emotional. The guys tend to be a little bit aloof and, you know, we're not into this too personal way of speaking about our faith. Well, this is David, great military commander of men, leader of a nation. In his childhood had been a shepherd. But despite all that, a heart that was open to God. And he knew that in his deepest place, he needed God. He longed for God. It was like a, a thirst, a soul thirst. So let me say to the guys, let's not be afraid to speak in this kind of language. Even if we use this as a prayer, perhaps sometime. Take your Bible, open it at Psalm 63, and pray this prayer aloud. Writing in one of his other letters, Paul um, speaks about not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed, he says. This big, sophisticated, overwhelming Roman Empire, and here we are coming from the backwaters of the Roman Empire in the, in a, in the province of, of Palestine, I'm um, not ashamed of it. We're here to tell you something, that it is not Caesar who is Lord, but it's Jesus who is Lord. That in itself must have been quite a thing for many people to take on board. Caesar was so almighty. They, in fact, thought he was divine. They thought he was a manifestation of God himself. That was the that the way that they viewed a Roman emperor, and in comes this very small little man from Palestine, and, and he's speaking about not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. And you can imagine, really? So Paul is, is, is so utterly convinced of, 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 of his of his encounter with Jesus and the reality. And of course, we know that slowly the gospel kind of moved through the empire. This very, very small little group slowly moved through the empire. And over the centuries, eventually, some of the Roman emperors themselves, particularly in the Eastern Roman Empire, professed faith in Jesus. Slow the Christian, slowly the Christian faith grew. There were some really bad patches, let me tell you. There were some really bad patches. Here, but anyway, what St. Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Now, what is all that about? Paul is saying to us that our faith has to do with this extraordinary symbol, the cross. And it's become so much part of your life and my life, our life, that we sort of really stop, step back and say, you know, what is all this about, the, the cross? It's so much part of our thinking. I mean, we see people crossing themselves right down, left, right. Some people go right, left. Uh, you know, there's a big debate as to whether you should go that way or that way. It's really not important, I don't think. Um, you see people doing that on the sports field. You, you see people doing that on the sports field. Um, people go into churches, many churches, and they cross themselves. I mean, what is all that? It seems such a, a central symbol in our lives. And yet when you stand back and think, a cross, the, the Roman symbol of execution, it really was an ugly symbol. Back in Bible times, nobody, but nobody would ever, ever have dreamed of taking a cross as the symbol of their faith. That's what those horrible Romans did to rebels and, and criminals, and they hung them on a cross. And now we have crosses that we hang around our necks, many folk. We have crosses that we use as earrings. We make the sign of the cross. What is all that about? And a lot of people are just puzzled. A man, a Jewish rabbi, dies on a rather ignominious cross outside a major, or well not major, but a, a, a city in the remote Roman Empire. Why, why, do we, why do we hang on to this? And still, 2020, I mean, we're supposed to be moderns. We're supposed to be sophisticated. We're supposed to be thinking through this. This is absurd. This is absurd. And at one level it is absurd. I think it's absurd. And yet, we know in our heart of hearts that it's not absurd. It's not. For some reason, that ancient symbol is not absurd. Now, I have used often this analogy that I'm going to describe to you. Don't get cross when I start this analogy, because a lot of people begin to get all worked up, and then it's resolved, and they think, oh, all right. So you go down the main road of Hermanus, and you stop outside St. Peter's. Have you ever seen the stained glasses, stained glass windows of St. Peter's standing in the main road? They're really ugly. I mean, they are seriously ugly. Now people get cross. You know, how can I be speaking like that? 
about St. Peter's. But I challenge you, go and stand on the, in the main road and look at the stained glass window and tell me what you think. And you'll shake your head and you'll say, James, I agree with you. It's ugly. But you're not supposed to say these things. Well, I'm telling you it's ugly. It's ugly. And you will agree with me. It's ugly. But that's not the perspective from which you are supposed to view the stained glass windows of St. Peter's, is it? You're supposed to view the stained glass windows of St. Peter's from inside. And then you go into St. Peter's. And then you look at the windows. And then they're beautiful. And what's the difference? The vantage point is different. And there's a different light that is shining. Suddenly, what was ugly, ugly, becomes beautiful. Now, I've been a great admirer of stained glass windows. Those of you who grew up in the Mutterkerk in Stellenbosch, that beautiful, beautiful stained glass window, I forget who, who made it. Beautiful. And on a hot summer's day, when I did a big service there some years ago, and the church was full, and that afternoon sun came streaming through that beautiful. But from outside, you wouldn't stop to look at it at all. The vantage point is all important. And so people look at the cross, and they say, oh, please, you know, it's ugly. It's ugly, and it is ugly. But it all depends from where you view the cross. If you're sort of a casual observer, you know, you're going to be like what Paul describes here uh, of the Greeks and the Jews. The, the, it's the cross to the Greek people, these people so refined, Greek the world of Greek philosophy and culture was, was a very direct challenge to the, very, the simplicity of the, the Jewish faith. They, they didn't like the way that the, the Greeks worked on the body and nudity and, and because the Jews were very conservative. There was something, a problem that they had with Greek culture, with all that refinement. And, and so the Greeks kind of looked down their noses. They looked down their noses at Christianity and this cross bit. It's foolish. It's utterly foolish. It is a stumbling block. It is a scandal. It is absurd. But you and I know that it's not a stumbling block. It is not a scandal. Because something of that cross has left its imprint on your life and mine. And what others dismiss as absurd, you say, no, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. And I can't explain to you always what it is about the cross. And I've told you, again, I've probably tell this every few years, one of the most extraordinary things I ever witnessed with my children when we lived in Natal some years ago. I was lying in my bed at one night, and you will recognize this story. I was lying in my bed, and I heard Ewan, who at that point must have been about two and a half, climbing out of his cot. And I heard the pitter patter of feet down the passage and there was quietness for a few moments and then the pitter patter of feet coming back up the passage and the little guy climbing into his cot again and then nothing. So I got up. I went to see what had happened. And there was my little boy, two and a half, lying in his cot holding on to a cross that he had gone down the passageway, got onto my desk chair, 
got onto my desk, and there above my desk was a cross. He'd taken that off, retraced his steps, and was lying in his cot, simply holding on to the cross. And I don't think I've ever seen anything quite as touching as this little boy lying. Now, it's not as if we, we never <laughs> sat and told a two-and-a-half-year-old about the meaning of the cross. We hadn't done that. I don't even remember any conversation between, between my wife and I at, about it. But there he was, clearly something. He doesn't remember it. Something was troubling the little boy. And that's where he knew where to go. And he lay there. I cannot explain that. I cannot. I try every power of, you know, rational thought. Well, maybe, whatever, subconscious, Freudian, whatever. I don't have an explanation for it. And so much of our faith, we don't have an explanation for it. You know, I mean, it is a mystery. And at one level, it is utterly, utterly illogical. And yet what our minds say is illogical, our hearts say it's real. It's real. Not everything that we believe can be tested against the bar of reason and shown to be X plus Y plus A plus whatever equals whatever. Not. I just accept that that's how it is. But there are mysteries. But the work of the Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit, is just something that is too deep, too deep to be understood. And the cross is like that. Yes, we have various views, and over the next couple of weeks, I will speak about those views. The, the cross as, as forgiveness. The cross as, and we describe the whole process of Jewish sacrifices and how Christ fulfills all those sacrifices. The cross as victory, where Jesus overcomes in that cross the powers of darkness and death, yes. But still, those are just sort of analogies, metaphors maybe. And they don't always stand the strict test of rationality as the world demands rational truth. And yet we know that what the Greeks describe as scandal on, uh, 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 a scandal, I mean, an absurdity, we regard as the power and the wisdom of God, which is very different to the power and the wisdom of this world. So take that on board. Next time you're in the main road, promise me you will stop outside. And to the Anglicans, don't be offended by my derogatory comments. You get the point. All right? Yeah. Go and look at that and be reminded. That is, the cross is offensive when seen from one point angle. But for us who believe, for us who believe, who've come into friendship and deep relationship with Jesus, it is the power and the wisdom of God. Amen. Amen.